God's nature, it's a pretty important thing to get right, isn't it? And we really need to approach it with respect and humility. If we worship a God that isn't the living God of the Bible, that's idolatry. If we're not humble enough to let our view of God be changed by what's revealed in the Bible, then we're blaspheming and willfully being idolatrous. That's pretty crazy to think about. Far too many people build a God in their mind that does not match up with the biblical descriptions of God's revealed nature and characteristics. In fact, this was a huge struggle for me when I was wrestling with my faith. Why do so many people seem to disagree about the nature of God? You hear it in statements like, I could never worship a violent God or a God that would murder whole nations of people. Or when people say, God's love and the Old Testament God was so angry, but the New Testament God is loving. Or how about, I can't believe in a God that would send people to hell forever. Well, unfortunately, if you believe those things, I have bad news for you. They're just simply not true. So I wanted to dive into a few things and unpack them around the nature of God's character. The Apostles' Creed, Athanasian Creed, then we'll jump into the 1689 Baptist Confession and get some takes on what God's nature is like. Why? Because this was the radical teaching of the Apostles on the subject. These creeds came about as affirmations of collected views of the church, uh, as the church fathers, as they knew and understood God's nature from Scripture. There are multiple ways we can misunderstand who God is, and these creeds attack the most basic ones very effectively. They give us a grounding by reiterating the nature and attributes of God that give us a foundation for how to think about who God is. They aren't complete, but they are biblical and concise statements that Christians should have no issue affirming. Some people don't like the creeds, to which I say, why not? I don't think there's a single good reason for a Christian to reject the creeds, even if they don't study them, memorize them, or promote them. They're still accurate statements of things Christians should believe. So on to the nature of God. One thing Protestant Christians believe, and I think need to focus on more, is the triune nature of God. This is a funny issue for me because people that don't want to treat the Bible woodenly and literally on some issues like homosexuality do want to treat the Bible literally on this. And it's blatantly obvious that there is a triune nature to God. Many groups of people have argued against this for a long time. The biggest argument being that Trinity, the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible anywhere. Uh, however, we see the impact of the Trinity throughout Scripture, including the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. We see this in the baptism of Jesus. When the Father speaks, the Holy Spirit alights on Jesus, and Jesus the Son is glorified by the Father. We see it in the Great Commission. We're told to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is triune in nature, and this is affirmed over and over again by the apostles in their teaching. In fact, they go so far as to say that if someone preaches a different Jesus than the Son of God, they're preaching a false gospel. This is one of the biggest outcomes of the Apostles' Creed, the broadest of all the, the creeds, I think. It outlines the bare essentials that Christians must believe to even consider themselves a Christian, including faith in God the Father, Jesus Christ his only Son, our Lord, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm not sure why this particular heresy keeps popping up, but even after the Apostles' Creed, people kept attacking the triune nature of God. So the Athanasian Creed was written, which reaffirmed Trinitarian doctrine. It begins like this, that we worship one God in Trinity and the Trinity in unity, neither blending their persons nor dividing their essence. It goes on to say that the Trinity represents a Father, Son, and Spirit, each uncreated and eternal that coexist as a single God. And it also reaffirms that though the Trinity has different roles as Father, Son, and Spirit, they are united as one God. This can seem confusing to a lot of people, but it really does have major implications. The Bible tells us there's one living God, but the uncreated God of the Bible is triune in nature because he isn't a God about raw power, but instead a God of love. He has built-in relationships. You heard that, right? God is triune, which means that he's love and truth and beauty. God being triune separates him from other gods. Other gods are either singular in nature, like Allah, and focused on power and domination, like the Islamic faith, which encourages domination of women and children and spreads by force. Then you have other deities that are impersonal, like Buddhism and atheism, where the cosmos is just an impersonal platform of goo, and the title of God is up for grabs to anyone that wants to worship themselves. Or they're plural and not all-powerful, like pagan gods, Zeus, Hera, Thor, Odin. They're caricatures of men. God being triune in nature has huge implications. He is all-powerful, he is eternal, but even as one God, he's triune and is relational in his very nature, and we inherit that from him as being made in his image. God is a spirit who needs nothing else to exist, and even then, God exists in loving relationship. This is one of the reasons I think the Trinity is such a highly attacked doctrine, actually, come to think of it. It makes God unique and loving. The fact that God is one and God is Trinity carries over into how we live our daily lives, which is why I think Protestants praying for reformation and revival need to focus more on this core doctrine of God's nature. Going back to Genesis, I want to point out a few things. God does not call the creation of heaven good on day two. God calls all the other days good because something is created, partly, I think, because something 
comes into being. God creates man in his image. In his image, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So man is an incomplete image of God, as is woman. And we're more of an image of God when we're in fellowship and love with each other. We're even more complete when we have children. When we put these things together, God's giving us a reality. Heaven, abstract and ethereal spirit things are not good in and of themselves. Separating things to make room for new things is good, and things that glorify God are very good. This is simply a reflection of God's nature, that he created things to be good. We become more like Jesus the more completely we seek to embody this nature and glorify him. So this outpouring of love happens as we build up our families. If I had one prayer answered, actually, it would be to take all the energy that men put into developing themselves in their careers and women put into self-discovery, and they put it into family development and discovery. That's why it's so important for me to talk with my family, to work for my family, always be seeking to put my family above myself. That's the example that Jesus, the Son of God, gives us. Jesus was cheerfully and perfectly obedient to his Father. The Holy Spirit filled the Son and enabled him to carry out his vocation obediently. We're to do the same thing. We're to reflect God's fatherly love to our families. We're to sacrifice like Jesus. We're to empower and enable our families as the Holy Spirit does through conviction and correction. It's a blueprint for our best lives. And the three examples we're given are perfect from our one God, our Heavenly Father, creator of the cosmos. Everything good from creation stems from the three and oneness of God. So I wanted to switch from the creeds and just take a look at what the confessions say about the triune nature of God as well. In paragraph one of the Baptist confession, it focuses on the Lord our God being but one living and true God. And it goes on to describe the attributes of God in unity, stating that God himself cannot be fully comprehended by any but himself. It says God's a pure spirit, immortal, eternal, immutable, almighty, every way infinite and most holy. It's really focusing on the fact that God in his infinite nature is all powerful and sovereign over man and the cosmos and that God's will prevails. Cue the Calvinists are monsters and heretics music. It also talks about God's nature to be loving and long-sufferingly patient who will by no means clear the guilty. Again, the confessions are summary statements that put a lot of information about a topic from the Bible into a nice little paragraph. I really don't understand why some people have such an utter rejection of the creeds and confessions or such a guttural reaction to Calvinism for that matter. So even though this section focuses more on the attributes of God in unity that applies to uh, all three persons of the Trinity, paragraph three, you know, ties it back in to the triune nature of God. And then next up in paragraph two, we see a focus on God's glory and knowledge. So it focuses on God as light and life. It still talks about God's sovereignty, but more about his perfection and how he's infinite, infallible, and independent. It also dives into how holy God is, going back to the doctrine that God will not clear the guilty of their sin. And it also goes a little bit uh, into a little bit about how God's creator so is able to demand of his creation what he wills. I think one line that really sums it up well is, he is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, and in all his commands. So again, there's more of a focus on the unity of the triune God and attributes that all three persons of the Trinity share. And finally, in paragraph three of this section clearly states that the Trinity is a prominent doctrine. The Trinity is affirmed right off the bat as the confession states, in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences, the Father, the Word or Son, and Holy Spirit of one substance, power, and eternity. So what's interesting is that the Athanasian Creed is affirmed in a big way in the confession. Three in one, all without being, in, or all without beginning, infinite, not divided, and distinguished from each other. And I think an important line is which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation for our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him. That is huge. Again, there's such a fundamental doctrine that we recognize that it's the idea of the triune God that allows us to rest peacefully in dependence on Him. So what's the easiest practical way to start applying this to your life? Well, you focus on this with your family. This is an easy one to talk with um, or talk about with your family tonight at the dinner table. And just ask your kids, uh, who is God? Have a conversation. See what they say. Then ask them about the three persons of God and see what they say. It's funny to me that so many non-believers act like this is such a difficult thing to grasp because my kids understand it pretty easily, but I think it's because it's literally the pattern of all creation. It's when you try to be smarter than the Trinity that it starts to not make sense. Having said that, I highly recommend you look up the Apostles' Creed, the Athanasian Creed, or uh, the Baptist or Westminster Confession and take a look at it. So ask your family tonight, who is God? Steer the conversation a little bit to the Trinity. See what your family has to say about it. Let me know in the comments if you eat dinner with your family, if you talk about the Bible at dinner, uh, what other habits or disciplines you're, you're using to talk with your family about Jesus. I'd really like to know what you guys are doing for that. And I'll be praying for you. I'll be praying for your families. And uh, with that, I will catch you in the next video. All right, peace.